So this week's episode, we welcome the amazing Chris Robinson. Ooh. Hi, Chris. Thank you. I'm not, I'm not sure about amazing. Yeah. Me. Very good evening to you. Yeah. So Chris and I go back a long time, and I'll tell you t- two sort of main links, but I won't give away Chris's story. So Chris was a team leader on the Flying Without Fear program for many years, particularly at Birmingham, but I think he worked at some of the other places as well, but definitely at Birmingham, which was your local. Yeah. And also, which will be relevant to a lot of people who listen to the podcast, episode 44, Chris composed the music for that. Yeah, so, I performed it as well, actually. <laughs> yes, exactly. Composed it, performed it, everything. And it was a gift to, to me years ago when I first did the audio book, and Chris kindly um, put it on there. So we've always credited him, but I bet none of you have looked at it and thought, I wonder who composed, and <laughs> this is the guy, you know. So, Chris, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paul. It's great to see you again. Yeah, so t- would you mind sort of sharing a little bit about your kind of fear of flying journey, uh, bringing Ooh, yeah. up as a team leader and all that sort of stuff? No. How long have you got? I'll do the shortened version. Okay. All right. So, um, my first flight was a school trip in 1973 on a, on a four engine turbo prop called the Britannia, (laughs) fantastic old uh, aircraft. And, you know, as a sort of 14 year old, 15 year old, it was just sheer excitement. I mean, I didn't think about, I didn't think about, you know, anything negative at all, you know, very interesting on takeoff because, uh, it was so smooth. I, I, you know, I didn't know. I wasn't sitting by a window. I had no idea when we'd left the ground. Uh, yeah. uh, and as we left, this was from Luton Airport. We sort of, you know, did some gentle drops, like as if we were going over a canal bridge or something uh, on the way up. And I thought, oh, that's what people talk about when their tummy goes over sort of thing. I thought, oh, okay. And then we flew over the Alps and went to Italy, and it was all very, I suppose, exciting, but in a way also quite uneventful. Um, uh, and the journey back was on a, a, a BAC 111, which was a proper jet, so that took off um, like the modern jets do. Mm. Uh, there was nothing; it just seemed to go so fast that even if there'd been any turbulence, I don't think I don't think we didn't notice it. We just sort of were amazed at how fast it went. Um, so it was all rather exciting. When I um, uh, later on, when I came to do flying again, I, I was I was working in my twenties, and I got to fly to uh, the USA, and all around the USA because I was actually touring over there in a band, um, and that was absolutely fantastic, um, a fantastic experience. And again, um, so many things. You know, I, I was amazed. We we went into airports, and they'd say, "Oh, we're." taking off from runway 29 and I'd think gosh this airport must be really big if it's got 29 runways because I didn't understand then that that's not how it works <laughs> but it was still that fascination of it yeah. and later in the 1980s I had I was leading a a, um, a, a sort of um, a technical part of a skiing trip I'd never been skiing before but I was actually a guest speaker on an event and um we we took off, and I remember this. I think it was the day after the East Midlands air disaster at the airport. I can't remember what it was now. So yeah. landed on the on the motorway, I think. Awesome. So I was a bit keyed up, and we were flying in a in a Boeing seven five seven from Gatwick to um, Vienna, and I experienced a takeoff like I'd never experienced before. It was a windy day. It was a rain. Or sorry, windy morning. It was a rainy morning. The visibility was rubbish. You could see air, the airplanes coming into land were moving around a bit. Not that that had bothered me up to that point. Um, and then we took off from from Gatwick, and I was sitting on the front row, uh, row one. And I can remember this quite, quite vividly. And I don't want to scare people at all because it wasn't. Looking back, it wasn't actually a scary experience but at the time because I didn't know what was happening. It was it yeah. was much earlier, and that was that we 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 took off, and as we were going up, it felt as though, and feelings are notoriously, as you know, notoriously unreliable when you're in a plane, mm-hmm. when you're on the front row because you can't see out of any out of a window. Um, it felt as though we were going all over the place, and then at one point. 
I actually felt myself being pushed down into the seat with some force, which I'm told by the pilot friends is quite unusual. Um, uh, and um, people I spoke to after the flight who were in our group, who were further down the plane, didn't have this experience at all. It was literally just people in the first three rows. And when I came on the theatre of flying course, uh, uh, the captain explained to me what he thought would probably happen there. Um, and apparently at Gatwick, because there's so much traffic in and out of Gatwick, um, they like to get, the air traffic controllers like to get you out and up, uh, up and out as soon as they possibly can. He said, and what probably happened there is you're taking off and they've, they've been looking to be, get clearance to go up to 30,000 feet. And when they do, they just tip, tip the plane back and go. And he said, if you're at the front of the plane, you would feel that much more than anywhere else. But because I didn't know it was happening, you know, that, that completely put the heebie-jeebies at me, really, if I'm honest. And yet nobody else on the plane seemed particularly bothered by it. The, the, air, the, the, the crew were fine, you know, we got up to 30,000 feet, it was nice and sunny, everything was lovely and smooth, we just carried on. But I was like a bit of a nervous wreck. And then um, uh, six months later, I had to fly to Israel to do some work there. And um, I was, uh, I, although it was a lovely flight, actually, I was, I was just all over the place. So I kind of somewhere on the lines, this, this experience, which I didn't understand at that point. Uh, do you know, for one thing I'd say to people, understanding what is going on really helps you. Mm. Um, finding the reasons why things happen. And I'll probably come back to that later. Um, so, uh, so then I kind of almost retired from flying. So when from, when would have this been? This would have been in 1989, right? Round right about the Kegworth Air disaster and just afterwards. Right. I don't think it held that that had happened the day before because we were all a bit. And I think Lockerbie was around that time, possibly as well. I don't know. It was all there was all in the news, which doesn't help either. Watching the news really doesn't well. help. So I hadn't flown for years, and then um, um, 2006, 2007, I thought, come on, I'll, I'll have a go at this again. So booked a flight a week, a week in Amsterdam with my wife. And um, once again, we took off, and I was grabbing onto the seat because clearly the, the plane can't fly unless I grip on the seat. You understand that? No, we understand. <laughs> Helpful, yeah. So they're um, ripping onto the seat, and of course, totally tense. The flight is completely uneventful. You get that feeling as you come in to land, and you look out the window, and you think, land, land, it's not far away. So I know all those feelings that people who come on on Love Fly will, will know and, and understand. And got there. And then I, the, the holiday for me is kind of partly ruined. It's a five-day holiday. For the whole of those five days, all I'm thinking is, we've got to go back. Yes. And that's not not pleasant. So it ruins the holiday to some degree. And then going back was, you know, another experience because anyone who's flown out of Amsterdam will know that if you're coming back to Birmingham, they usually take you out to this runway, which is like three miles about something. <laughs> it almost feels like you're halfway home to Birmingham before you've even taken off because you're still, still traveling on the runway. So... Um, and then uh, coming back uh, uh, again, pretty uneventful, really. My wife was loving it. She thought it was great. Um, uh, we had this experience coming into land of Birmingham where you kind of keep dropping a thousand feet every so often. You know, sort of, okay. with, I think they call it stair stepping as they come down, but they don't do. I don't think they do that anymore. It's something they they didn't stop doing. But anyway, that's. Um, Again, I didn't know that. If you know all these things, if you understand a little bit about what's going on, yes, it can really help you to to, to rationalise the feelings that you that you're getting, and the feelings you're getting can't be trusted anyway. Which is, you know, kind of, in one sense reassuring, in another sense it can be a bit disorientating. Mm. So anyway flying without fear fast forward to 2013 and i decided it really i had to do something about this because it was stopping us from doing yeah. the same things so i thought let's have a look 
um, if there's anything happening at uh, Birmingham. And sure enough, Virgin were doing a course from Birmingham. And I, oh, I must have I must have visited the website about a hundred times in about <laughs> a week. <laughs> yes, and almost pressing the button. Yes, but not quite. <laughs> Um, but eventually I did. And once I had done that, I then decided that I would prepare myself for this. And this is where it got really interesting because I hadn't realised this on YouTube. Lots of ordinary people, as well as aircraft enthusiasts, actually took videos out of the portholes of them taking off and on their journey and landing. And... Whether it was desensitising, I don't know. You're, you're, the, you're the expert psychologist. But I found that the more I watched these videos of, of, of as if I was on, this, on the plane, mm. knowing, while I was watching the video, knowing it was going to land okay, because the video obviously, you know, was still there. Yeah, get uploaded, yeah. Get yeah. uploaded. <laughs> you know, I kind of relaxed a bit. And I stuck it on the big TV screen. I just sat back and I, I watched video after video after video after video of takeoffs, cruising, landing. Um, and, and one of the things I think it did for me was it normalised the fact that you just get on the plane, you take off, you travel, you land. Well, wow. so... By the time I came to the course, I was actually a mixture of scared stiff about doing the flight at the end of it and totally looking forward to doing the flight at the end of it. It's, it's funny how you can hold two contrary things in yeah, your brain. Yeah, definitely. You don't know which one's going to win, do you, on the day? No, you don't. You have no idea. But I kind of almost, I think I'd got, I'd got to the point where I thought I've got to do this no matter what. No. A week before the course, I don't think I've ever told you this. A week before the course, my wife and I went to Birmingham Airport to have a wander around. And I've got to tell you, the fear of just walking around the airport was almost debilitating. And the thought, if I actually caught sight of a tail of a plane across the, through the window or something, or worst still, one taking off, I was absolutely shivering, shaking. Yeah. So real it was that it could affect you. And when you think about this, this is totally irrational. Um, Clever though, isn't it? The brain can do that. Yeah. <laughs> it cons you into thinking something. Mm. And all, all, the, all that comes back is that takeoff from Gatwick seems to come and, you know, sort of like a, like a, a demon hovering over you. You can't think of anything else. It's just always there. So um, anyway, so... Um, did the course, uh, got on the plane, which flew from Birmingham to, well, Birmingham, <laughs> via North Wales, I recall it very well. It was a lovely... So story. how were you during the course? Because I, I don't remember you coming on the course. I remember you coming back as a team leader, obviously. Yeah. You know, no disrespect, uh, but with a hundred people in the No, room, not at all. I always remember people that... You know, it it was an that. unusual course, actually, because it was Captain Dave Kistruck, who was the pilot. Oh. Normally doesn't do them, so... Um, it, it was really good. We we had a long walk from the hotel to the airport through the NEC centre. Oh, that's right, yeah. And it was a beautiful sunny day. Oh. Um, and I'd already, uh, we, we were going on a plane called an Embraer 195, and I actually had watched some videos of these planes coming out of Birmingham. It was as if you were, so I was really quite excited to see what one looked like hmm. um, at this point, at the same time as really not wanting to get on it perhaps. But, uh, but nonetheless, I palled up with someone else who was equally as frightened as me. And uh, we sat next to each other. She sat by the window. I was, I was a gentleman, you see. I quite would have liked to have sat by the window, having watched all these videos out of portholes. Um, but actually, the whole thing was quite an amazing experience. It was particularly because it was a sunny day, we, we flew up to the North Wales coast and you could see the whole of the North Wales coast right from Chester across to the land Dudno and right across to Anglesey. And just seeing it was, was quite gobsmacking and for a moment you forget mm. that you're supposed to be scared. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, ah, so it is possible to bypass the, that whole thing. Mm. Um, 
and the landing was was absolutely fine. Um, so the course, yeah, the course, it you you go through this sort of up and down emotions through the day. I found, you know, there are, there are, there, are, there are times in the day where you think, "Get me on the plane now," and then there were other times in the day thinking, "I'm not sure I'm going to do this." Mm. You almost, I almost had to sort of make a, a decision that was nothing to do with how I felt. I kind of, and I think I've made that decision subconsciously before I came to the course, which was, whatever happens, I'm getting on that plane yeah. because I'm not going to let it beat me this time. Yeah. And there was a kind of gritting of teeth and determination involved. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so, so that kind of, um, that kind of carried me through the day, really. Um, I was I was also it's funny how little things you remember from this. We had a lasagna lunch, right? And I actually remember thinking I won't eat too much of this because I don't want to be sick on the plane. Yeah, it's strange, isn't it? How I mean, it's even affecting you 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 what you decide to eat. Um, but anyway, so so actually the whole thing was 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 really exciting, and I actually was in the end was actually be much better than my the lady who was sitting next to me who. Um, he grabbed onto my hand a couple of times, and I know what that's like because I've done that to other people in the past. Um, but you know, we we both came off smiling and feeling we'd achieved something. Yes. But I, at that point, I knew that was only the start. Well, and so that's a good little. I love the way you did that little pause there. <laughs> yeah. Dramatic effect. Dramatic effect because it was because I then said to my wife Lynn, "I'm going to have to do this again on my own, mm. or with with Lynn, and I'm going to have to do it frequently because I reasoned whether whether or not everyone probably thinks like me. It's just as well, really. I'm a bit weird." Um, no comment. But, but for me, yeah, well, you know. <laughs> um, but for me, um, if I keep going back and facing the fear regularly, it's not a fear anymore. Mm. Because the more you do it, the more you learn from what it is that you're doing. Yes. The more experiences you'll have which are different and you learn to cope with them. So... I think it was about three weeks after the after the course. I managed to get a cheap. This is when flights were a bit cheaper than they are now. To be fair, I managed to get a twenty pound day return to Dublin from Birmingham, and I thought, now I've done a forty five minute to an hour flight on the course. It's only thirty minutes to Dublin, so I've only got to do thirty minutes there, thirty minutes back, and I also get to see a country I've never been to. So I said, well, nineteen ninety nine. That's good. I, I bought Lynn a ticket as well, so it was only forty. Very generous. Yeah. No, I thought so. I thought it was very good. The hell with it. Forty pounds. <laughs> it spent an extra five. Well, so spent an extra five actually for a seat with an extra extra leg room because this was on an Airbus three twenty where they they've got the exits over the wings, so there's yeah. the doors there, and they give you more leg room. So paid a bit extra for the leg room, and. Um, and it was really quite nerve wracking because suddenly you're you haven't got the support of a and I do, I do mean mean this support of a plane full of other fearful flyers because it, it sounds daft but when you're all fearful flyers there's a certain kind of community on yeah. that, that 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 keeps you together. And well, suddenly... well, we knew it, it's been proven actually that when you get like a hundred nervous flyers together, wheeling it up. <laughs> you, use, you use less fuel. So uh, is that right? Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. No wonder. I, I'm, I'm surprised we don't see more flights like that, to be honest. Huh. <laughs> um, but, of course, now I'm just a passenger. Mm. I'm just doing normal travel. I'm going through security, not with a big bunch of 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 people who are all fearful flyers, but I'm just going through and nobody knows. Know if anyone else is scared. You don't know if if they're regular flies. You don't know anything. You just think, well, I've got to behave myself now because I can't melt. I can't have a meltdown. Well, I'm going to look a complete idiot. So anyway, first thing I noticed when we took off from Birmingham on Aer Lingus was um, the kind of sense of 
you know, that, that kind of, it's almost like, I suppose it's like riding a surf wave, really. It feels a bit like you're sort of just, just mm. gently going up, sort of a little bit up, a little bit down. But you, you don't notice the ups so much. You just notice the downs more. So, you know, a, a, and I kind of thought, oh, a bit, well, that's a bit weird. But yeah, okay, that's okay. We've come out. We've t-. And I, and the other thing was that, that I've done, I forgot to mention this. But in watching videos, I even managed to find videos of this exact flight. Oh. It was EI-263, I think it was, which left Birmingham a quarter past eight in the morning. Oh, see yeah. beard I've got there. <laughs> um, and so I, I searched for it by flight number, and there's, there's flights up there where you, know, you get them. So I had an idea of what everything looked like as he took off. Mm. And the same when you come into Dublin, you can see, oh, if I sit on the left-hand side where he's taken that video from, I should be able to see that landmark, that landmark, that's as we come into land. So it kind of occupies your mind with something else. Yes. Which is also very useful. So one of the things I've noticed was the Airbus makes some horrific noises when it's on the tarmac. Um, one which almost sounds like a dog... A dog is stuck in the hold underneath you and he's barking. That's right. And when I when I watched this video and I thought, what the heck is that? Yeah. So, but then again, thanks to YouTube, well, right, Airbus barking dog. And there's, you can come across all kinds of things. And there's there's actually a few videos of, of uh, aircraft engineers showing you which bits of the hydraulics are underneath, which make this strange noise that sounds like a barking dog. Now, I've got to tell you, Paul, if I hadn't known that before I went on that flight, yeah. I would have been absolutely 100% sure the plane was going to fall out of the sky. Yeah. And been looked after properly. It didn't matter the fact that the air, air crew just ignored it. And I'm thinking, come here, that, that, that horrible noise. <laughs> <laughs> but because I'd researched it beforehand, the, the mm. peculiarities of that plane, I knew what to expect. So when I heard it, Guess what? I smiled. Yeah. Because I knew what it was. Yeah. And it was perfectly normal. And because I knew it was normal, it didn't bother me. Yeah, I've noticed that weird noise. It always used to make me laugh. I was like, what? Did we go, have you got a seal down there or something? It's a weird noise. <laughs> so, yes, we have, yeah. Right. yeah. Very strange. But, um, and the other thing was that I found that was really useful on this flight was I explained to the uh, the senior cabin crew lady that I'd just done a fear of flying course and this was my first flight after it. And she mind just saying hello to me at some point during the flight, asking me how I'm getting on, that's all. So I sat down before I knew where I was. She'd given me a copy of the day's newspaper, a complimentary drink and all kinds of other things. I didn't ask for that. But it was kind of as though she was going the extra mile to try and help, yeah. to try and help it be a, a good experience for me. And as a result of that, when I did more flights in the future, I actually found it was useful to write a little letter, which I which I did. Where so when I went on these, call them training flights, if you like, um, I would actually write this letter out saying, "My name's Chris. I'm in row, you know, D twenty two or whatever it was that the seat was." I've just done a fear of flying course and I'm trying to do more flights to get used to mm. flying's like. And I can't really say, I can't speak hardly enough for the cabin crew. I just can't because I, I wasn't asking for freebies. I just wanted them to understand that if I got a bit nervous, there was a reason for it. Oh, the things that I've been offered. Well, we've got... Uh, so, Chris, how long did you do that for? What do you still do? Training flights. Uh, for as I, well, I got into it. I got into it, so it be, it became a bit of a bit of a kind of hobby. So it started with going to Dublin and back with Lynn. Then the following weekend after that, I did. I went to Belfast and back, but I went. I went out on EasyJet to the uh, Aldergrove Airport, booked a taxi to show me around the sites of Belfast and take me to, back to Belfast City, and came back on a plane from. Belfast City back to Birmingham. So I had a, a, a complete morning out in Belfast. And the journey back on that particular flight was very windy at Birmingham. For those people who know Birmingham, it's notorious for its crosswinds because the runway is the wrong, the wrong angle, really, for, for the UK. 
And as we were coming into land, it was it was going like this. And I was sitting there and I was thinking, I'm really enjoying this. This is great fun. Um, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't think. I, and, and I actually got off that flight and that was the moment where I thought, mm. I think I'm winning. Mm. And I remember patting the plane on the side as I went out the outside of the fuselage. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, and I said to the captain that on the way out, I said, that was a bit of a windy land. And he said, yeah, he said, you get those at Birmingham. It's a bit of fun, isn't it? I said, it was actually, yes, it was fun. So then, it, the, the, you know, I, I just kept doing them. I thought, well, look, we've done a 45-minute training flight, uh, sorry, a 45-minute flight with Flying Without Fear. So anything an hour is really quite easy. So I looked at all the places I could then get to with cheap flights and booked them all in advance. So Edinburgh, Glasgow, day, these are day trips, Amsterdam, Paris. I was just going all over the place, just as were wonders. And then I found someone who was equally as daft as me, uh, one, of, one of my piano students, actually, um, who liked flying. And I said, uh, should, should, we, should we see if we can book a sort of three-way or something like that? So he, he left it to me. I was getting quite good at booking flights at this point. So so we did that early morning flight to Dublin. And then we got a flight. We had about a one-hour link. And then we got a flight from Dublin to Amsterdam. Oh. Then we went into Amsterdam and had lunch and, you know, sort of had a walk around, whatever, and then came back, caught the last flight back to Birmingham. It was about seven in the evening and got back to Birmingham at night. So so we did three cities in a day. Oh. And then another time we did Dublin, Edinburgh. Oh. Or did we go from Edinburgh? I think we just came back to Birmingham. That was on a, a propeller plane. Interestingly, I was very dubious about going on a propeller plane again. Which is daft because I had a good experience on a propeller plane, but um, it was a bit just just a bit different. But actually, in the end, it was actually quite a good experience. So it's just, yeah. just the same as a jet, except the except yeah. the the fans are on the outside of the engine rather than the inside, so they're just a bit noisier. Uh, so that was great. And then eventually, I think that the biggest one we did, the biggest adventure we had, was Birmingham to Dublin in the morning uh, with uh, Aer Lingus, then. Dublin to London with British Airways. And again, remember, I'm giving them my little letter, uh, and, you know, and at the, the, I, had a, I had a lovely written note back from the captain of that BA trip, actually. Um, and they invited me to, to, uh, to go and sit in the captain's cockpit just after we'd landed. So literally, we landed at Heathrow and they invited me to come in and sit in the sit in the cockpit. So we'd literally been down, and the engine switched off about ten seconds, and I was already sitting in the pilot's seat. And I, I thought, wow, you know. And that's just because people who work in aviation seem to really, really love it, and they kind of want other people to love it too. Very Is that true. A good assessment. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, so they really want to help you, actually, if you kind of let them know uh, that that you'd like some support. Oh, that's so that was fantastic. And then we flew Virgin, Little Red, from London, having got there, we got London to Manchester, um, and then of course we can't get a flight back to Birmingham from Manchester because it's not far enough. So we got on a Virgin train and came back instead on the train. So we did four journeys in a day. We were absolutely shattered. Oh, it's a surprise. Look at But it was great fun. Um, it really was. And, and you get to know the insides of the airports. I mean, I know, I know how Dublin Airport works, Birmingham Airport works, all the rest of it. Because remember, this is a person who was frightened of going to an airport. Oh. But, familiar... <coughs> Excuse me. but familiarity with the way the airports work. Uh, and you kind of, again, familiarity gets, gets you to the point where actually fear doesn't come into it because you think, well, we go up those stairs, we go down that road, yeah. we go up to that jet, yeah. like this. I mean, you know, if it's a domestic flight, we go in that building. If it's international, we go in that one. And you just think, yeah, I, I know what I'm doing now. You're like airport information on legs, aren't you? Well, uh, when it came to Birmingham, I used to give my groups a, a, a sort of um, uh, a running commentary of what, you know, what was happening everywhere yeah. and you know where the where where the sales people had come up and spray you with perfume in the hope you'd buy some and things like that. So you know, yeah. No, so it's great. So how long from then, from doing our course, did it did it take you to then come back as a team leader? When when did that start? 
<laughs> I'm not totally sure. It was fairly soon. Mm. I think it might have been even the same year. Yeah. I think I, I was. I came on a spring course, so it may have been an autumn one. Well, that of course was something else altogether because um, team leader sounds very fancy, but all it is is just you know you're just helping other people who are in the same boat that you are. Yeah. Um, but the fact that I'd been on the course and then could come back and actually say, "Look, I, I, I'm getting over this." You know, I mean, I, do you ever say you're completely over it? Possibly. I, um, I haven't really thought about that in any, any great depth. Mm. Um, but I don't think... I, the thing is, I'm no longer a slave to the, the, my brain wiring. And actually, all I'll do, if, I, if, I, if I've got a flight coming up, I'll just go and look on YouTube and see what other people have done. Um how long it takes, which aircraft come on and all that kind of thing. I've even planned some of the flights. There are, there are, there are sites where you can find what the aircraft's going to be. So I've actually planned them so I make sure I get a different experience. So I've been on all kinds of different airplanes just because I want to know what it's like on yeah. on the different airplanes, really. Because yeah. I don't want to become, as as people like me, used like I used to be, will will be, which is, well, I'll only fly on a Boeing 737 because that's the only one I feel safe on. It's bonkers. When you, when you think about it, logically, it's bonkers. So you started to help on the... You came forward, you started to help them. What was it like being a, a helper then, having been on the other, the other side of it not that long ago? Um, it was easy to empathise. Mm. Um, because I... Uh, some of the things that people told me their experiences, which had put them off flying, were much worse than what I'd had. Yes. Um, and yet I knew, because I'd done so much reading and so much research, for example, one lady I seem to recall had been through some pretty bad turbulence around sort of Thailand or the Far East area where you cross mm -hmm. the... where the airplane appeared and I say appeared, to have fallen a long distance. Yeah. I say appeared because I, I did some research into this. And um, altimeters um, will show you that, it, you know, you might, your body might say we've fallen 100 feet, 300 feet, 10,000 feet, whatever. Yeah. But the altimeters hardly move. They hardly move. And I, and I, I got... The, I got the sense of what they were saying here when I went f too fast over a canal bridge nearby where I live. Because you only have to go off the canal bridge a little bit fast. Mm. And you so momentarily, you know, your tyres leave the road. Yeah. And you feel like the whole world's sort of, you know, you, you've perhaps moved about a foot. Well, um, and, and And then I kind of began to realise that actually... Our senses aren't really designed as humans to understand what is going on in a plane, or indeed over too fast over a canal bridge, in fact. Um, but when you've got nothing out the window as a kind of reference point, because the horizon is so far away, yes. you wouldn't know if you'd fallen one foot or ten feet. Mm. Most turbulence, I am told, reliably, is, is, is less than ten feet, either way. No. Um but it doesn't feel like that. And the other thing that, that I discovered about that was the the importance, and I, I, for me, I'm not saying everyone should do this, although I think they probably should, <laughs> um, where, always wear your seatbelt. Yeah. Always wear your seatbelt. Because as far as I can research, nobody has ever been injured in turbulence if they had a seatbelt on. All right. Because if you if you're going at what six hundred odd miles an hour, and you suddenly drop five feet, then you're going to go five feet up into the air, <laughs> and you're going to go through the ceiling. You know, if you've got your seatbelt on, that is not going to happen. Yeah, you're going to strain against it, but but that's all. Yeah. Um, it, it's the cabin crew that that are probably the most at risk yeah. from turbulence, especially with flying trolleys. 
but um, but then that's probably why they tell them to buckle up first. And then you know, if if I, if ever I'd been on a flight, and I have been, where the captain said, you know, cabin crew need to buckle up. You know, immediately everyone's going, oh no, we don't, we're all going to die because we're going to go into all this. Yeah, it's, you know, uh, uh, but actually all he's doing is he's looking after his mm. colleague because mm. that's the safe place to be. Lock everything down just in case because we don't want anyone to get hurt. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so I've learned all kinds of things, honestly. You have, haven't you? Here's another thing. I, I must share this with people because it's a dead easy thing to do and I, I can't remember how I came across this because I know a lot of fearful flyers can't get their head around how the plane can get up. And I, although on the courses we talk about, you know, lift and all the rest of it and, and how it all works, the the and we talk about aerofoils, Scott, sorry. We talk about aerofoils and it's the shape of the wing that's sort of, you yeah. know, in a certain way. And I actually proved this to myself when it was on the way to the airport. My wife was driving me to the airport and we were going up the M42. And I'd been told, you know, try this. You have to be careful because it's actually quite hard work. But wound the window down from the passenger seat. <laughs> I, put my, I put my arm out a little bit and left it flat like yeah. this. And then I made it into a slight aerofoil shape. Oh. And it nearly took my arm off. Yeah. It was unbelievable. And then the other thing that this said, try and feel the wind as you go along the way. If you put your arm out the window, don't put it out too far. But if you put your arm out the window and actually do this, try and feel it. You can feel, because you're going at speed, yeah. the air feels like uh, treacle. Yeah. It really feels like treacle. And you think, well, hang on, if you're if you're taking off at 150 miles an hour, by that point, the wings are not perceiving the air as what well, we think of it as just still. You know, to the plane, it's 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 basically almost solid. Yes. And no wonder planes go up because they can't really do anything. They're, they're, you know, they're literally you're going through effectively at that point solid air. We don't think of air as solid, but it is. You put your hand out the window on the motorway and you feel it. And they, you, you get a much better understanding, I think. of. Yeah, well, I was just saying, it's a really good reminder, that is, because it, it's very easy to... Not, well, you just, it's very hard, actually, to think... I don't know quite how to work it out. And it's very easy to forget that there are physical forces going on, but you can't see them, you know. Yeah. And that's a great way. Although, um, yeah, a little bit of a safety warning. Yes. Get down the motorway or yeah. freeway. Uh, doing that, yeah. Just yeah, be careful. Yeah, just be careful because it, it can it can literally pull your hand back. Yeah. With the power of it. Yeah. So, yeah. No, well, that's a good reminder. Because I used to do the one where you blow over the top of a piece of paper. Oh yes. And then it lifts up. Yes. And you're like, and that's sort of yeah, how does how's that work? You know, but it it's, that's what that's what lift is, you know. And uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, but you know, you hand out the window going down the motorway, well, you know, autobahn, freeway, whatever. But uh, probably what once you get above fifty miles an hour, that's quite dangerous. Yes, yes, I, it, it, and, and it's the same reason, of course, is why. I mean, I sometimes go out on my bike, but the power of the wind is, of course, um, such that you know if you're in a headwind and you're trying to bike, mm. you go very fast because you're fighting what is an incredibly powerful force, and that's only like twenty or thirty miles an hour. Of wind. Yeah, you know, if you're going down a runway at one hundred and fifty. The, the, you know, the, the faster you go into the wind, the more the more solid and the f more of a force it becomes. And mm. once you once you point the wings in a certain direction, there's only one way you're going, and that is up. <laughs> I love that. That's a really nice. That's a, that's a. No one has said that for a long time. I think it's a great reminder of the how practical the you know the, and physical everything yeah. is. I love that. That's Talking great. about that, there was another video I saw. I don't know if it's still on YouTube. This is fascinating, this. When I was doing all my research, there's apparently a, an aircraft graveyard somewhere in Nevada, maybe. I think that's right. Yeah. And where they send all the old 747s, all the rest of it. And of course, they take the engines off, obviously. They're just, they're just sitting there. But there are some videos of what happens when the desert wind blows. Oh, I've seen those. It's great big 747s. They start to try and lift off. Oh, I know. It broke my heart. I saw one of those. I, I think I saw an ex virgin one in the desert and it was trying to lift up and it, it, it looked really sad. It looked like he wanted to fly again. You know? Again, yeah, because that's somebody once said to me that they, they're made, they're not made to be on the ground, airplanes. 
they're not very good at going along runways, basically, or, 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 or taxiways, because that's what cars are for. I said, once a plane has lifted off, somebody said to me, it's in its natural environment to do what it's good at. That's the moment where it actually is happy. And that's very true. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Oh, there's been some lovely tips so far. So we're going to sort of, as we get near the end of our episode, I can't believe how fast the time is going. So. Sorry, I, I do talk no, a bit. No, it's good. I like, you know, people like, they like this, you know, you're hitting the sweet spot of the, the length that people like. Uh, as far as I know, anyway. No, I'm not like different, yeah. <laughs> They're far too long, Tizard. Um, one of the things I would, I always ask people at the end is kind of give us a, Give us your top tips, your, your, your uh, you know, Chris ruling some gold around do uh, this. What, how would you sum that up? Uh, well, I think you do have to have a certain amount of determination. I think I've alluded to that. You have to always kind of say, I'm going to beat this. I'll find my way of beating it, but I'm not going to let it beat me. Yes. I think that's important, that sense of resolve. Um, for me, knowledge was power. So the more I could find, I actually, in the end, I got so interested in airplanes and that I actually joined a, a, a group, as an Irish group, actually, uh, that used to do um, arrange trips to things like maintenance facilities and behind the scenes in airports. Or mm. we went to the when Flyby existed, we went to the Flyby headquarters in Exeter, and we got to um, got to go down an emergency slide off the off the you know, oh, amazing you think. So I've actually, and again, you think this is an experience that may one day, mm -hmm. hopefully never, but the fact that I've done it means it's not unfamiliar to me. And that it's yeah. fear of the unfamiliar is the thing I think that we have mm. to be. Mm. So, so yeah. Um, so going in, I've, I've, I've even, I, my, my wife bought me a, a couple of hours in a flight simulator. So I could have a go at flying one myself in the flight simulator. That was fascinating. Uh, what was really fascinating about that is this this flight simulator we were in was a 747 flight simulator and there was a, a real pilot next to me. Um, and my wife was sitting in the back. And it wasn't a moving simulator. It was a, it was a static one. Oh, right, yeah. The only thing that moved were all the, was the scenery around you. It was oh. all around you. Yes. And both me and my wife still at one point stood up and nearly fell over. Yeah. Because our senses were were so adjusted to following the scenery that actually when we stood up, we're trying to counteract the movement. <laughs> and, and you stop. When you come off, you think, hang on a minute. This thing doesn't even move. And I think, no, no. so when I'm in a plane and the plane is moving, how much more difficult is it to, you know, to understand what is actually going on? Short answer, can't. Um, but you're best off just... Sitting down, leave your seatbelt on, and just ensure with the flight. So uh, yeah, so that that was a, that that was a that was another moment. And I think the other thing is, for, as I say, for me, knowledge is power. Um, and I, I, I've got to say, the YouTube videos were absolutely brilliant. Mm. A third tip, particularly if you're doing a flight. Um, I, I remember when I went to that trip on to Belfast on EasyJet, coming into um, Aldergrove Airport. There's a whole set of um, landmarks, and I made sure I got a seat on the same side as the bloke who took the videos. and And I watched them. I knew. I knew. All, I'd, I'd looked on Google Maps. I knew what they were all called. So that's that. <laughs> that's that. That's that. Yeah. And I even heard, because I was sitting near the front, I even heard a scary noise from the cockpit. Now, in the past, that would have scared the living daylights out of me. But I knew because I, whoops, excuse me. I knew because I'd heard it on the video and it said what it was. It was just the autopilot disengaging. Yes. What was it? At that point, the pilots were actually manually flying it. And that's all it means. But if you're sitting just behind the cockpit door and you hear this, this scary alarm, you know, as a fearful flyer, that's it. We're all going to die. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's just a complete wrong assumption. Yeah. You know, because, because we're ignorant, we don't know what is going on. Yeah. So a little bit of knowledge goes a long way. I know some people say a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. Um, 
I do say sometimes to my students when I'm trying to say to them, sh sh uh, make a point. I've watched lots of people piloting planes into Birmingham Airport on a cockpit view, but you really wouldn't want me to pilot you into Birmingham Airport just because I know what happens on the on the YouTube video. That would be very dangerous, and I wouldn't have a clue either. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no yeah. disrespect. No, I wouldn't want that either. No, I'm, I'm, not at all. No, yeah. I know you can make you can, you know you know your way around the piano, but uh, it's just I'm, much, I'm much happier on a piano than the, the, than in the cockpit seat. But I, I'll tell you something: I, I've had so many good experiences. It's opened up a whole new world for me, and I've got to say that perhaps one of the most pleasurable experiences. Uh, and we and we've had some. Uh, d d I don't want people to think that we haven't had some. You know, inevitably, the more you fly, the more things will happen. Uh, do you remember that uh, flight we had? Where we got hit by lightning? Yeah, on the, yeah, the Birmingham, that Birmingham flying with that vehicle. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Bit of a non-event though, wasn't it? Let's be honest. It was. Well, that was the thing, wasn't it? Because I remember I was actually standing up at the time, which I, you know, I say I, I sound, I don't do that very often. I was, I was checking on my group and that they were all right. And there was this flash, no noise. I didn't hear a thing. Just a big flash, and I t immediately turned around because I thought someone had taken a flash photograph of something because mm. that's exactly what it felt like. It didn't affect the plane. The plane just kept flying. There was nothing, you know. Yeah. It was much, you know, and and somebody said, uh, I think it was the, um, the the captain doing the commentary said, uh, oh well, and, and and we're just coming down through thirty uh, through twenty thousand feet, and we've just been hit by lightning on the right wing, and now we're going to ask the air traffic control to let us into the, you know, it was just it was just kind of another thing on his commentary. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was absolutely nothing for him. Yeah, and of course. You know, it was nothing actually, but yeah. you could imagine that the euphoria that everyone came off that flight with because mm. they couldn't wait to tell their relatives yeah. and friends, "We've been hit by lightning on the plane, and we're all right." Yeah, it was first, and was the only time it's ever happened on a flight without vehicles. Yeah, to be hit by lightning, which is pretty probably cool. never happened again. Actually, no, probably never happened. No, again. it was uh, yeah, because I've heard people say, "Oh, you know, when it you you get like um." Electricity come through the cabin, and everyone puts their hands up and touches it, and all this. I'm, I've never had any of that. No, no. Well, quite disappointed, really. It was a bit of a, it was like a t tiny sub noise, bit of flash. Oh, was yeah, that it? bit of a non-event. Everyone was underwhelmed. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Yeah. So yeah, so we've had some great experiences, and and every time something similar to that happens, you you kind of think, well, I've got, I've, I know what that's like now. I've experienced this. And he, he, all these experiences just add up, and excuse me, they kind of build up an internal profile almost of things you can call on. Yeah. So going back to the beginning of my story, which is probably a nice way to come full circle, because I didn't fly very often, mm. I didn't really know what was going on. Yeah. So when something unusual, whether it was a dog barking under the under your feet or whatever it was, happened. It's, it puts you on high alert. Yes. When you understand so many of the things that go on, it, you know, it becomes a very, dare I say, ordinary. Just like going on a bus. Yeah. Well, it's not a bad, bad aspiration for people, right? Just to be ordinary. I mean, I have to say, some of the buses I've been on, I think it's, it's far more dangerous on a bus than it is on a plane. Yes. Well, that is true. That is true, yeah. So, a quick question for you then, because you've seen, you've helped a lot of people. Do you think it's possible for everyone to get out of their fear of flying? Yes, absolutely it's possible. Absolutely it's possible. You have to be very open-minded, I think. Mm. You have to be. It may be that for you, you have to do more research, you may have to do more reading, you may have to do more thinking. I think the the danger with the fear of flying is that you can easily think you'll just go on a course and it's a magic pill or a magic bullet. For me, the fl the, 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 the year I went on the Flying Without Fear course as a delegate was actually the culmination of about five or six months of yeah. YouTube video watching, reading about flying and mm. finding things out. 
so that by the time the day came, I was, yes, I was anticipation, in, anticipating, and, and some of the anxiety was very much anticipatory anxiety. But I kind of knew enough that I could, that it would help me through it. If I'd just gone straight on, if I'd, if I'd booked it and it had been the following week and I hadn't had time to prepare for it, I don't think I would have found it as useful. No, I think you're right. And, and some people, they do exactly that. And they're, they're just not in the right mental state. Yeah. And sometimes it's the relatives and friends who've forced them to do it. I mean, I know some, some people came on the course yeah. and said, I'm only here because my husband's bought it for me and I've got to do it. Yeah. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. And you're thinking... That's probably not the best starting point. No, it's a, it comes from a good place, but yeah. uh, unfortunately, the person it's got to come from that individual. They've got to want to do it. it. Has really, yeah. It has. Yeah. It, you have to want to overcome it, mm. and it is. And just remember that it is actually your brain playing tricks on you. It really is, you know. And 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 the perfect example of that is that that flight simulator cockpit where you know. I, I, it felt like we were in the air and moving around, but actually this was a static yeah. thing. And if you, if it can feel like that without moving, then mm. imagine how much more it feels when you're actually in the plane. You just have to ignore your feelings and just say, "Well, it feels like we're going up. It feels like we're going down. It feels like we're on our side. I'll just I'll just leave it for a bit, and it'll it'll come back." And it does. I had a takeoff out of Edinburgh that felt like that. I thought, "Oh, this is really weird." It's kind of going, "Are we going left? Are we going right? Are we going?" I have no idea what we're doing, and I thought. Just relax. Yeah. Give it a few seconds. It'll all settle down. And sure enough, it... Mm. No, because our brain's just... I've no clue what's going on. We just stay with that. No. no. And, and the brain always tries to make sense of things, even when it can't. So it's always... It's kind of wired to try to come to a conclusion. So we're trying to make sense of the feelings we're feeling, but actually there's no point. You just might as well wait a bit until... It, until you've got more information and then have a think, well, yeah, okay, so that was just that was just a bit weird because we were probably just banking or something, but I didn't realise it at the time. Yeah, that's a very good point. So the last thing I'll need you to do, Chris, yes. is to tell us where your music is. So people who've, who've liked your music from yeah. episode 44, yeah. the relaxation, um, they, they want maybe on that piece, but maybe they want some other of your bits of work. How do they find you? Yeah, I mean, who knows if some of these, some of this music actually came as a result of the fear of flying thing? I don't know, but I, I mean, I, I started doing sort of solo piano, uh, relaxing music, mm. um, two or three years after I'd been on the first course, actually. Um, and I remember you, you had a CD and used to play it during the day, actually, on the courses as well. Um, yes, the best thing to do is look for my name, Chris Rollinson, on uh, Spotify or any streaming music service. You'll find all my stuff there. Um, I also have a website at chrisrollinson.com, which tells you a little bit more about me. Um, nothing about fear of flying, actually, though. Sorry, sorry about this. <laughs> um, and um, and yeah, and please, please, uh, by all you know, uh, have a listen to everything that's there and stick it on repeat overnight. I do have people who've written to me and said they actually find it really useful for insomnia. Um, I, I, the people who the people who tell me about the music, generally speaking, it's it's usually insomnia. So they put it on repeat overnight and just leave mm. it quietly in the background, or road rage. So interestingly, if you play, and I've tried this out myself, if you play the the, the pieces I've composed as you drive, as you're going along, you begin to think, I can't be bothered if anyone cuts me up anymore. <laughs> So it works for me, and I even wrote it. Yeah, bit of relaxation, bit of fear, fear of flying, and road rage. Yes, that's it. What a mix. <laughs> Mr. Rollinson, thank you very much. It's been great. My pleasure to you again, and uh, thank you for telling your story. I don't, I don't really uh, wasn't doing the podcast when I was running the other version of no, the that's right. horses, and so it's really interesting to catch up with people like yourself, who are kind of new, but. I didn't know all your story, so thank you. That really interesting. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. And 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 let me just say to all those who are on the course at the moment, you can and you will get there.